Hi, everyone. Um, thanks very much for having me to here today. Um, as you can see, the subject is informing without alienating. But I actually want to spend quite a bit of time just talking about why it is so important that you don't alienate people. Um, am I loud enough? Yeah. OK. Um, I know it might seem really, really self-evident, but I think especially when you're kind of all set together in a room like this, it's quite easy to kind of start talking a common language and there's a, a temptation perhaps to forget some of the people that are outside of the room who might not understand these incredibly beautiful and technically impressive visualizations. Um, but my job as a journalist, I think, is to make, um, make sure that what I do makes sense to as many people as possible. Um, that's not necessarily a definition of journalism that everyone agrees with, but it's, it's something I think is really important. Um, so I want to start out by just asking you to consider one thing, which is I'm sure pretty much everyone here has probably made at least one chart. Some of you have probably made hundreds and hundreds, but how many times have you actually been in the data set that you're visualising? And this is something that I've actually thought about for a really, really long time. Um, in 2010... I started working for um, the statistics department of the International Organization for Migration. I was working in the Iraq office trying to keep track of how many families had become refugees as a result of the war in Iraq um, and how many were displaced within the country. But more important than just kind of simply counting how many of those families there were, I was trying to understand what those families needed, whether they needed water, whether they needed an education, food, what they needed to basically kind of stay alive. Um, but those statistics also served a second purpose, which was to be able to go to donors and say, this is the money that we need to be able to kind of provide for those Iraqis. Um, and I have a really, really important and slightly difficult confession to make, which is that I was really, really bad at my job. Um, and that's not me being modest at all. Um, you can look at um, this chart. Um, which proves it. Um, I made this chart. It comes from one of the reports that we published, um, and I have some big issues with it. It's actually surprising. The thing that bothers me about it is not the fact that it's an ugly pie chart, because, again, if you think about the people that are outside of this room, actually, all around the world, it's charts like this that people are producing in classrooms and in offices. Um, the fact that it's 3D, obviously, is not great. It is plenty misleading. But there are other things that I think are really, really deeply problematic about it that kind of explain why it was that I was so bad at my job. Um, the first of those is just simple geography. So. I wasn't actually based in Iraq. Like so many of the humanitarian organizations at the time, we were based in Jordan because the situation in Iraq was just so, so bad. And I think that geographical separation from the data you're analyzing is super, super important, and it's really easy for us to forget about it. It meant that I couldn't just sanity check some of the results that I was looking at. So let's say, for example, I kind of noticed that there was uh, electricity problems in one part of the country. Without actually being there, it's really hard to understand whether those electricity problems are because of like a kind of a short-term outage, or whether they were like systemic within the country, or whether, in fact, actually people had just kind of misunderstood the question that was being put to them, and were talking about electrical products as opposed to electricity itself. So that geography was a big, big problem for me. There's another reason why um, I have a big problem with this chart. Um, if you remove the labels, I could be depicting absolutely anything here whatsoever. I could be showing the types of underwear that women wear. I could be showing murder weapons, anything at all, because the actual visualization is so divorced from the subject itself. Um, and I know that the idea of kind of communicating something personal about the data might feel a bit alien to some of you. This is a really cheesy transition. Speaking of aliens, um, this is uh, Lieutenant Commander Data from Star Trek. And um, Data, for those of you who don't know him, I feel like this, this is probably an audience with some Star Trek fans in it. Um, Data is insanely smart. He can compute just about anything. And that's why he was such an asset to the captain. There's only one thing that Data can't do, and that's understand human emotions. Except in season one, episode 13, uh, Data's identical twin, Law, shows up. And Law is supposed to be some kind of upgrade on Data because Law has the emotion chip that Data doesn't have. Um, but actually, that's kind of a problem because while Data is super, super virtuous, Law, with his emotion chip, is kind of manipulative and self-serving. And I actually think the fact that that was kind of depicted in that way reflects how a lot of people think about Data, that it's emotionless and that it's good for that reason. Um, and that's kind of problematic for us because very often people who are working with Data don't really have an incentive to correct those people. It's great if people think that we're like these perfect humans doing things with no kind of input and no biases in what we're doing. 
But I think that is actually really important to be honest and upfront about what it is that we're doing. There's no such thing as emotionless data visualization because any visualization is being visualized by a human who feels emotion. So we just need to kind of acknowledge that. We make choices about fonts, about colors, about scale all the time. Um, now, reason number three why I think I was really, really bad at my job um, is I think the most important reason, which is that um, the charts I was making were being shown to a couple dozen people, sometimes a hundred. It was mostly donors and colleagues. And actually, they weren't being seen by the people that needed to see them the most, which is the Iraqis. So the Iraqis who had provided us with this data weren't being given any kind of mechanism to say, hang on a second, you kind of you got that wrong. And I think this happens all the time. Um, one aspect of this that was kind of relevant is that this report um, was eight megabytes in size. It was absolutely huge. And download speeds are not the same around the world. Uh, and the fact is, is that some Iraqis would have had to have waited for ages and ages in front of their screens to have just simply downloaded the thing. Um, and that's even just the Iraqis that were speaking English. Some of the reports were translated into Arabic, but not all of them were. I can understand the reasons for that. We were working in an incredibly difficult environment. We needed to be efficient. And the most important people that we needed to see these charts were the ones who were giving us the money to just do our jobs. But at the same time, it meant that what we were doing lacks transparency. We weren't being transparent about the limitations of the data. We weren't being transparent about the limitations of the visualization. We weren't being transparent about the limitations of us, the people that were actually putting this stuff together. You can't see my process here. You can't see whether I collected this data from questionnaires or face-to-face -face interviews. Um, you can't see how many people I'm depicting. It's just a failure all round. Um, and especially, as I said, the fact that this was kind of just spat out in a PDF that didn't give Iraqis the opportunity to say you got it wrong. And again, that's super, super ironic when the people that you're visualizing, you're saying these people are disempowered and you're not giving them the op opportunity to kind of say you're wrong. Um, so it's a really, really intense experience. And as I said, I was really, really bad at my job and I don't like being bad at my job. So um, in 2012, I decided to go to Iraq to find out if I was kind of getting my numbers right. Um, it was... Um, I've just jumped to the wrong part in this, sorry. Um, it was pretty uh, intense um, because I realized how little my charts were really, really communicating the reality that was there. It was, they were completely out of touch. Um, and so as a way of capturing something that felt less abstract, I started to um, take photographs that felt a lot more real to me of kind of like what life was like there. And I started to take photos all the time. I was taking hundreds and hundreds of them. And that kind of process of repetition meant that I started to notice patterns in some of these photographs. And noting patterns, as you know, often leads you to want to kind of visualize uh, data. So eventually, I kind of turned these into, into charts, some of the photos that I took. And I turned um, them into charts and uh, produced an exhibition of the photographic images in 2013. So I'm just going to talk you through a couple of the, the a couple of the visuals that I made in case they're interesting. Uh, this was a woman just kind of walking down the street um, in Baghdad, and I turned it into a bar chart. And what I'm actually displaying here is the proportion of women aged 15 to 49 who think that a husband has a justification for striking his wife. And I know that the, like, the terminology around this sounds kind of like quite bizarre, like that that was the way that the question was worded. But I think it's really, really easy to forget the the kind of cultural differences about the way that you ask a question. So in a country like Iraq, just asking people, you know, have you been abused by your husband represents a massive intrusion into someone's private life, right? So the data you're going to get is going to be incredibly, incredibly flawed. So you have to be creative about ways that you kind of understand trends. So this um, data actually comes from the Iraqi census. And as you can see, uh, one in five women think that uh, a husband has a justification for striking his wife um, if she burns the food. Like really, really shocking data, but I just wanted to remember some of the actual people behind the data. And for me, using photographs was really important in order to do that. Um, similarly, this one uh, is just some Iraqis in the north of Iraq. I've actually cropped the y-axis out of this in case anyone wanted to have a guess of what it is that I'm visualizing here. Can you see the line chart at the top? Does anyone want to visual guess? Sorry? Um, no, that would have actually probably been a better thing to have visualized with this particular image. Uh, it's, actually, um, it's actually depicting foreign aid, so it's, it's quite useful for kind of seeing how the country was uh, quickly, I wouldn't say forgotten, but some of that financial aid trailed off. And the idea of using electricity was because the economy was kind of running off of that financial aid at the time. But yeah, that would have been much better. Um, this one here shows um, 
because obviously working for the International Organization for Migration, I was kind of focusing all the time on the numbers of refugees, the number of uh, people that were internally displaced within the country, as well as refugees had, who had kind of come back to Iraq. Um, and again, the idea of something like this was to really, really remind people that this data represents humans and to fix it in a kind of geographic landscape of Iraq itself. Um, this one uh, was, I actually was helping someone who wanted to write a will. And in Iraq, you kind of, you go to these, these people out on the street. Um, this was like a guy literally sitting underneath an umbrella and you go and get one form from him and then you get sent like a mile down the road to get a stamp from like another guy. And this comes from the World Bank. They don't actually publish this indicator anymore, but it just explains to you the number of steps that are needed to enforce a contract. And I wanted to visualize it this way because when you're actually doing it, it's such a painful bureaucratic nightmare to get anything done. And every single one of these steps creates an opportunity for corruption. And actually, the endemic corruption in the country is really, really relevant for the statistics that we're looking at. And it's something that's so easy to forget. So before I went there, I was like looking at education statistics all the time, things like um, the percentage of Iraqis that had graduated from high school, literacy rates, numeracy rates, things like that. And while I was there, I kind of started speaking to this mother who explained to me that her daughter was falling behind in school, not because she necessarily wasn't doing very well, but because even the teachers in the schools accepted phone cards as bribes for kind of giving the kids better grades. So I'd been spending all of this time looking at this data set on kind of school grades with no understanding of the way that that data had been completely distorted by facts on the ground. Um, so going there really, really helped me to understand the way that I wasn't, the, the kind of the missing gaps in some of the things that I was looking at. Uh, this last one here was an attempt for me to kind of do a better pie chart. Uh, I'm not claiming, by the way, that any of these are very, very good. I like look back at them with the benefit of hindsight and think they're pretty bad in lots of ways. But this one um, showed that nine out of every uh, 100 Iraqis, uh, their cause of death was suspected torture. And the idea, again, was so that you couldn't look at a visualization and lose sight of the people that were within it or the, the kind of human side of things. Um, and that even if you remove the labels, you still kind of get a sense of subject. Everything's fixed in like a real time and a real place. Um, the other purpose of these charts is that they're supposed to be very, very inclusive. So the process here, you can see that kind of someone has selected the images and it almost looks like a real collage, right? That's kind of been cut out and stuck down. So hopefully people can see a way that they could actually replicate my process. And I think that's really, really important. I do not think that data visualization is for geeks. I don't describe myself as a geek and I don't particularly like the label geek because I think it just creates a new community of insiders that can be quite exclusionary. And it's really important for me that as many people look at my work as possible, which is the reason why I eventually moved into journalism. And I'm not ashamed of the fact that I kind of seek out readers and want a lot of readers, because as I said earlier on, those readers can kind of check my work and tell me whether or not I'm getting things right. Um, so I, um, I started working out of The Guardian's uh, data blog, and then I moved eventually to um, 538 over here in the US. And while I was there, as Irene mentioned, I um, started writing a column called um, Am I Normal? Where um, the name eventually switched because we felt like it might sound like we're kind of placing some kind of moral or ethical judgment on the readers by providing a response to those questions. But the idea was that A, I could not only get more input on the visualizations that I was creating, which was super, super important, but I wanted to have input about the questions that I should be asking, what data sets I should be looking at, what hypotheses were kind of out there. Um, and I want to talk about one, one of these columns in particular. I produced dozens of them, and I still write it um, now, but for a different site. Um, so I got this one question from a lady called Caroline, who was 44 and living in Philadelphia at the time. And she wrote to me and asked, um, Dear Mona, I recently read an article that said most of the prison population is religious. Well, there are very few atheists in prison. Please tell me if this is true for the United States. So as many journalists do, I kind of merrily found my data. I started analyzing it and visualizing it with the help of Reuben Fisherbaum and Alison McCann at, the, at 538. Um, and we thought a lot about the best way to visualize this. So should we be showing raw numbers? And we eventually felt like in order to respond to this reader, what they were really interested in was ratios. So which populations are kind of over or underrepresented in prison relative to the US population as a whole. And as you can see, um, Pentecostal, Christians, underrepresented, and then there are more in prison uh, Muslims relative to the US population as a whole, and also um, Jewish uh, inmates as well. So I published this data, and as I always do at the end of my columns, I invited readers to get in touch. And they did. I had some former inmates who got in touch to explain to me that part of the reason for this data is that 
If you are in prison, as these individuals had been, sometimes you get access to better meals if you're eating kosher or halal, as opposed to these standard prison meals. I also had it explained to me by former inmates that sometimes, if you're members of certain religious groups, you get extra recreational time, which gets you out of your cell, which is super important if you're in prison for 23 hours a day. Um, so the, the, the ability for people to get in touch and explain to me the why is super, super important for what I do. It informs the theories I make. I'm not saying I'm going to kind of accept those anecdotes at face value, but it gives me new lines of inquiry. And I honestly think that my job is actually quite boring if I just kind of relentlessly describe the what um, of things rather than kind of understanding why things are happening. Which is why my inbox is really, really important uh, to me. And I'm going to um, share some of the questions that I've got in my inbox that I think are quite interesting because they reveal, again, some of the things that the general public are thinking, um, is thinking about data. So this one, um, which was sent to me in 2015, do attractive people have more uh, sex than ugly people? And I think it's interesting because I could quite easily imagine throwing a blog post together that did really, really well and people just accepting that data on face value without any kind of interrogation of what exactly is meant by attractive and ugly. And I think the need to kind of take a step back and explain the definition of terms and the methodology of the way that you're collecting this stuff is super important. Here's another one. Um, am I the only one that doesn't use the designed opening in my underwear when peeing? And I, um, I thought this was an interesting one. I assume it came from a man. Um, and as someone who doesn't own a penis, I, I didn't think this question was interesting at all, but I kind of shared it on social media. And actually, a lot of people do think this is interesting, and a lot of people wanted to share their data with me, which is quite nice, because my, what I find interesting isn't necessarily the same topics as the people that I should be serving find interesting. So to be able to check that is super important. Um, this one is quite dark. Um, so someone asked me what the autoerotic asphyxiation success rate was. Um, and they're obviously quite keen for a certain answer because I'm sure the vast majority of times it's performed, it's done successfully, right? Right? Um, you can kind of hear like the, the desire to, for reassurance there. And, but this question actually got me thinking really, really critically about your responsibilities as a data journalist, right? Like, let's say I was actually able to collect that data. And let's say that that data showed that 90% of the time, you're fine if you do this, you're totally fine. How can I put that into a chart that communicates risk to a reader in a really, really responsible manner so that people don't just see that chart and do something that is potentially quite dangerous to them? And when you're doing health reporting, these questions are really, really critical because you could actually be shaping kind of people's choices. Um, and then just really, really simple ones like how much pee is a lot of pee. Um, so this, this last one leads me to kind of like the last bit of my very strange kind of annotated, uh, somewhat narcissistic resume, which is um, the thing that I'm describing right now. But um, I want to talk about the kind of last iteration, if you like, in the way that I've tried to think about data visualization. So as you can see from these messages, 538 readers are kind of special. And um, this actually happens around most websites, right? The internet doesn't create this kind of perfect flat space actually you get kind of clusters and communities around certain things so I write for the Guardian now there's a certain type of Guardian reader that's not necessarily the same as a 538 reader so I wanted to publish on something that felt a little bit more flat and could hopefully give me access to new audiences I also wanted to um, resist the urge to produce interactives all the time all the time because it's something that I'd started to do and I wasn't thinking critically about when I actually needed to ask the reader to kind of get involved and when I needed to just give them the kind of simple image and the and this and a, a kind of more simplistic story um, so I started to basically use Instagram because I thought it was a really, really good way as well to the comments underneath the images are really, really fantastic because they're transparent and it gives an opportunity to kind of have a discussion and a debate around that visualization. So here's one that I did, which was actually a response to this particular question. Um, how much pee is a lot of pee? Um, I, um, I try to use everyday objects whenever I can in order to convey scale. I think that's super important, right? Like, not everyone necessarily grasps the same units of measurement. We use different units of measurement. And even if we use the same units of measurement, sometimes, especially when you're using large units, it's really difficult to understand how much we're talking about. But pretty much everyone has held a one litre bottle of liquid in their hands at some point, and that can kind of help them to understand it. Speaking of scale again, this is another one that I did, again, thinking critically about some of the work that I do. I don't really think I need to have my hand in it. It kind of makes it look like a mini basketball. But the idea is to, is to convey the relative size of the basketball. 
and the hoop. This is a slightly more serious one here that again is about scale. So this is contrasting the average parking space in America with the average solitary confinement cell. And what was quite good about this, I think, is that I got online abuse from both sides of the spectrum. So I got abuse from people who were saying to me, how dare you imply that prisoners have too much space? And I had abuse from people claiming that I was implying that prisoners had too little space, um, which I think sometimes bodes quite well for the way that you've kind of visualized, visualized something. Um, I also want to use this as much as possible to kind of, again, reach out to the community of non-geeks, so to show that data is relevant to everyone's lives in ways that might not be expected. So there was a journalist in uh, New York who did a Freedom of Information Act request to find out how many decapitated animals there were in New York parks. And um, I was able to visualize this and show which ones were kind of the most commonly found animals. So there's a lot of headless chickens. This is over a 10 year time period, but still kind of interesting. And in, it wasn't always just heads. It was sometimes just like the bodies and not the heads. They were found in like school playgrounds and this is very, very bizarre. But anyway, super interesting and like got people thinking about like why this data is the way that it is. Um, and was shared quite a lot, which is for me always a, a good thing. And then finally, circumcision rates, um, showing the benefits of kind of doing uh, small multiples sometimes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, before finishing, I also want to talk about some examples of what I think are good data journalism that aren't my own um, and good visualizations. So again, I want to come back to this idea of conveying the imprecision in what we do, the fallibility of what we do. And one way to do that is actually to just focus on kind of one one very, 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 very small data set in a way. So this comes from um, this blog that some of you might know called um, The Quantified Breakup. I think that's what it's called. It was a Tumblr. Um, and it was written by a woman who was going through a divorce in New York. And she visualized all kinds of aspects of her breakup. She visualized the messages that she was receiving, the frequency, the time of day they were, they were kind of exchanging messages, her and her ex, how the relationship fizzled out. She visualized how much sleep she was getting. And she visualized this, which was times that she just started crying in public and couldn't control herself. And people really, really loved it, not just because it told a story, but because I think it was really, really honest in terms of its claims and its limitations. This wasn't one woman trying to claim that she was representing divorce in America or divorce in New York or women in general. She was just saying, here's my story in the data. And it, th I think that transparency is actually something that's pretty great. Um, this is a very, very different kind of example. So this came from uh, the New York Times. It was done by Gregor Aish, um, Kevin Keeley, and Amanda Cox. And they basically asked people to draw the data themselves. This charts the parents' income versus the likelihood that their children will attend um, college. So you kind of draw out the data, and then you see how you compared to the actual reality. It tells you a story as you're doing it, and it invites you to interact in a way that feels super, super inclusive. And then you can kind of see how you compared to other people. Again, it was just really, really friendly, and it just had great design. Um, and then the last one I want to talk about um, is, uh, earlier this month, The Guardian published, or I think was a pretty good analysis of 70 million comments that had been published on the website. I don't know if any of you guys saw this. And I think one reason why it was really, really good was that it didn't overwhelm the viewer in terms of too much data. It broke it down into several different several different slices so you could see how levels of abuse kind of varied by gender and by subject area. But what was also really, really good about, I think, is that it allowed um, the reader to kind of take part in this little quiz where you could read a comment, that, a real comment that had been left on the site and decide for yourself whether you would have blocked it and defined it as abuse or left it up. And what that did was I think it really, really helped to convey, A, a sense of scale, because you realise that you kind of took a, a minute or two to decide whether or not this comment was abusive. And then you're like, whoa, 70 million of these have been analysed. That, that's a lot. Um, and it also showed you that even though you've, you've been reading all of this, what seems like truly, truly objective data looking at the scale of abuse, once you read that comment, you realise that every single one of those data points represents a small human decision about whether or not this is abuse. It's based purely on subjectivity, even if the, the whole altogether appear, appears objective and is objective in some ways. Um, so I thought that was really, really smart. Um, now, I know I've kind of touched on a lot of uh, disparate topics, so I um, would like to close by kind of thinking of some ways that we can um, basically get better at what it is that we're doing. So I would say that even though data visualization has obviously made leaps and bounds and has progressed hugely, in some ways our data literacy hasn't and never will. We're kind of 
flawed human being. So if I was to ask everyone here to say how many people they think are in this auditorium, we'd probably get very different responses on range. And the, the bigger the scale, the harder that is, right? If you're in a huge, huge concert venue, it's really, really hard to guesstimate how many people are there. And so we have a responsibility to kind of communicate scale to readers in be much better ways. So even something as simple as 70 million comments, trying to un help people to understand how many that actually represents. Um, and there's all kinds of simple and complicated ways of doing that, but I think it's really, really important as a goal to kind of bear in mind. The other thing that I think is super important, if I haven't made it kind of clear already, is the notion of conversation. So as I've said, I think con kind of communicating and interacting with people makes me so, so much better at what I do. So Gorka used to do this thing that I don't think they actually do anymore, where you could leave comments on photographs. And when you hovered over, you could see where everyone had kind of clustered together to have a conversation. So if this was the photograph, say, you could see whether people were more interested in the President of the United States or a wealthy two-year-old child. Um, and if you imagine this example translated into a chart where people were able to leave comments, it would actually be incredibly powerful. You would be able to see if everyone's having a conversation about one year in the, in the data on a line chart or something, or whether everyone's focused on one state in America of their conversation, or even if everyone is just talking about one dot in your scatter plot, maybe that's a point of inaccuracy in your data and you need to go back and change it. And I think that's super, super helpful for having a more focused and a more kind of fruitful uh, discussion. Uh, that was when I was going to say about Obama and the child. Um, now, the last thing that I think is really, really important as well is that we just get better at communicating uncertainty. That was kind of the idea of me starting to do things like hand drawings and using photographs. It was about admitting fallibility better and showing that actually this isn't perfectly precise, which I think some data visualizations do kind of communicate to people today in a way that I find slightly troubling sometimes. Um, so there's all kinds of ways that you can communicate the uncertainty, whether it's just kind of plotting out things around an average or plotting out probabilities differently. We just need to think more critically about it. Um, so the last thing I would say is that, um, you know, yes, data should strive towards objectivity and fairness, and visualizations should keep on trying to do that, but we shouldn't be alienating people because if we are, we're actually jeopardizing the quality of what it is that we're doing and that the internet doesn't solve everything. Yes, theoretically, you do have access to a whole lot of people, but you have to reach out to them. You have to make sure that you're publishing in the same language as them, that they are available to you regardless of their internet speeds. Um, and that we, you know, in a very, very concrete way, we're actually unelected officials who are kind of representing people in our data. And if we're not checking in on them to say, have we got this right? I think there's something um, pretty dark about that. So um, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I have some time for questions, right? Yeah, if anyone has any, any questions for me. So um, I think it's a really, really great question. In an ideal world, I think I should be picking up the phone every single time I write an article because the spreadsheet just doesn't tell you everything. Um, very often that's incredibly difficult when you're in a newsroom with a kind of couple of hours of deadline. No, that sounds like a really, really lame excuse, but it's just kind of like the reality sometimes. So I think the point is, as you say, to kind of have it be more iterative, to have people get in touch. And you know, the, in my defense, this piece didn't claim to explain why, it just like claimed to be showing this, this is the what, but people are actually really interested in the why. And so being able to go back to that piece and say, this is what people had kind of told us, but not just this is what people told us, but then kind of making it investigative and finding out whether or not those reasons actually play out among a broader audience, um, you know, across prisons across the country, I think is actually really, really important. And I think the, the nice thing about data journalism, if it's done right, is it kind of 
questions the notion of who are the experts, right? So generally, when you're writing journalism, you call up an academic and you say, hey, you're an expert on like prisons in the US, tell us what's going on. And that's still super, super important, but actually the individuals within the data are so well qualified to understand what it is that's going on. And as long as you provide them with the tools to be able to get in touch with you, it's incredibly powerful. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a constant challenge. And I think I agree with you that these aren't perfect, but the, the kind of idea behind them is to show their fallibility. It's very obvious that if a human has hand drawn this, it is not a perfect representation of the data set itself. And if anything, I think that they're intended for me to counter what it is that I'm doing in my day job, nine to five, which is conveying precision with kind of quite frightening. Uh, maybe I'm being a bit over the top to call it frightening, but you know, like. I, I want people to question the data behind the visualization more frequently. Um, so I don't know if that actually answers your question, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this stuff. Like, I, it's all about communicating. To, it's not saying these are perfect visualizations. It's about showing that these are not perfect visualizations. Yeah. Um, I think I actually think people are super, super skeptical naturally, and I think a lot of people do naturally kind of ask some of the right questions. I think source is always super, super important. So, for example, if um, polling data is presented increasingly now, people are like, "Was that poll based on 100 people? Or was it based on 2,000?" And they and they get that there's a difference between the two. I would argue that even a poll that's based on 2,000 people is not necessarily the most accurate thing in the world. Um, and I still think that actually journalists need to do more to kind of communicate the weaknesses of things like polling to readers. Um, so I think understanding sample size is super, super important. Understanding not just sample size, because that's quite an easy example, but um, sampling methods. So let's say, for example, um, very often when a poll is published, it will say a nationally representative sample of 1,000 people. But sometimes that nationally representative sample, for example, included one black person who was weighted up to represent all of the black people in America, and it's somehow nationally representative. So I think being able to peel back even that top layer of the data and say there were 1,000 people here, and say, how many people were there in this data set that looked like me before I interpret this is super, super important as well. Do we have time for a couple more? Yeah, if there were a couple more. Maybe there's not. No, OK, no more. OK. Um, I actually think one thing that was quite good was, um, I don't know if you guys have seen, 538 actually published the probability forecast for different candidates. And by showing the kind of hump of all of the possibilities before showing the ones that they think are kind of probable and their kind of middle one, it really communicates a range of different scenarios to the viewer, which I think is quite effective. Um, I actually think that it's been kind of lagging. We haven't really been thinking about it very much. So we've got like a bit of ground to catch up on of, of ways that we can kind of communicate that uncertainty. Um, I think lots of people have done things that are based on like deaths, so contrasting the number of deaths that have resulted from, from what thing A versus thing B over time. Um, the problem with all of that, though, is that 
it involves a lot of kind of personal choices about what you're going to make that contrast with. So if you take, for example, the risks of guns in America, people on both sides of the spectrum will just choose a different reference point in order to convey the scale of risk. Um, so I actually think one thing that can be quite informative is breaking down that risk by different demographic factors. So for example, showing something the New York Times did, um, the likelihood that you're going to end up in prison depending on your age and depending very importantly on your race. Um, so helping readers to kind of find their way into the data by presenting their particular demographic to them can be super important. Um, I think there's some really, really small things that you can do. So, um, you know, I think at all points during this conference, it's come up at one point or another during everyone's, um, everyone that's spoken is this idea of kind of staggering things and telling it to you in a story. And where attention comes in that I think is really interesting is, I don't know if you noticed, but on that, um, the slide that I had from The Guardian where it showed that chart, it showed four of six. And I think communi communicating to the reader, listen, like you're going to have to see another five of these or another three of these helps stay pe keep people kind of focused because it's not like, oh my God, is this going to be infinite? How long am I going to have to scroll for? You know, I have five minutes before I have to get back to work or I'm hungry or whatever. Just being able to let them know how long they're going to have to save you. It's like, you know, before you watch a video, for example, you'll hover over it and say, am I going to be here for 20 minutes or for five minutes? So I think that's one really, really good way to keep people's attention, to break it down into different um, sections. And I think that's part of the problem with some interactives. Some interactives just demand way, way, way too much. And sometimes, actually, they can just be split out into, like, uh, several flat graphics that tell a much more compelling story and require less of the reader. Yeah. Um, I think the process question is really, really important. So there's a piece that I'm quite proud of uh, that I did with my colleague Andrew Flowers at 538. And what we tried to do was we tried to find out what was the most common first and last name combination in America. And what was nice about that is that every single part every single step of your process tells you a story in and of itself. So you start off with what are the most common first names? And people are interested in that data kind of in and of itself. And then you're like, what are the most common surnames? Again, people are interested in that data in and of itself. And then you talk about how if you assume that the probability is even for, say, any given first name and any given surname, this is what the data looks like. Again, kind of interesting. And then you say, actually, when you use a phone book and look at things, you can see how those an even probability isn't the way that life plays out. Because if your surname is Smith, you're probably not going to want to call your son John because it's just so boring. So, so being able to explain that to readers, every single step was inherently interesting of it in and of itself. And I actually think that as practitioners, you find that all the time, right? As you're doing your steps, you kind of find some interesting little nugget before you move on. And I think remembering them and conveying them can really help keep people kind of with you throughout that process. Yeah, to, yeah. Um, I think this idea of going to them rather than expecting them to come to you is really, really important. This is a very, very uh, weird example, but I wrote an article on pubic hair and uh, it was posted in this like forum that is like feminists for pubic hair justice or something. So I don't know why that is the first one that came to mind, but I think if you go out into like the communities that are really, really passionate about the thing that you're doing and share it with them and say to them, please come and please contribute to this discussion, it shows them that you're not just kind of making the right noises, you really do care. And like, you know, I respond to the people that write to me in my inbox. I think that's really, really important. And I go into the comments thread and I'll say, hey, that's an interesting point. What about this? Um, so I just think showing them that you're actually willing to engage is really, really important as well.
the time, like all the time. I'm trying to think of like just one example. Again, I don't know why my mind is really, really in the gutter today. Uh, <laughs> but um, one that came to me was someone said to me, this, which seems like a completely plausible theory to me, that because of smartphone usage, um, more and pe more people have piles because they're sitting on the toilet for so long, just on their phones. Uh, and I was like, that's interesting. And yeah, there's no data on <laughs> piles versus smartphone usage. Um, but yeah, all the time. But John's you know really, really nice. I haven't talked about this at all, but I think that we as data journalists don't do enough to actually do the process of collecting the data. So that's one reason why I showed that kind of quantified breakup thing. So there's two examples where I did this. And I can understand why we're, why we're reluctant to do it, right? Because if I collect data from Guardian readers, those are Guardian readers. They are not representative of all of America in any way. But I think you can communicate that to people really, really honestly. And in a way, it's even more transparent, right? Because you say, we asked Guardian readers, and people get that Guardian readers are not representative of everyone. So I did it twice. I did once I wrote an article on redheads and asked people whether or not they felt like redheads experienced discrimination. I kind of just did this like little blog post and stepped away from my desk. And when I came back, I'd used a Google form. It had completely crashed because 20,000 people who claimed to be redheads had very, very strong views on whether or not redhead discrimination exists. And I did another one um, that asked people uh, about their sex habits. And the thing that's really, really nice about that is it was so easy to communicate the limitations of that data. Because for example, someone that entered in some data said that they lived at 10 Downing Street. Like, you know, you put that in the article, people get it. David Cameron probably didn't contribute data to my article. Um, and it's quite powerful because it still shows you, okay, we don't know anything about this phenomenon. This is the best we can do in terms of right now, just saying something about what's going on. It's just fun. It's just fun apart from anything else. Should I wrap up? Yeah. Thank you.